Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 46 of the Titan Forge podcast. Is it 46, Tuttles? It is, in fact, 46. All right, nice. Um, my name is Dratnos, joined by my accounting assistant, Tettles. Hello, Count Dratnos. And, uh, of course, we are rejoined after a couple weeks of absence by Trell. Welcome back, Trell. Hey, guys. Glad to have you back. Uh, it's been, a, it's been a, a few weeks, though, so you were a little busy with MDI stuff. Um, but now you're not busy with MDI stuff for a while now. That is correct. So... That's good news for us and that you'll be on the show, hopefully, a lot going forward. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Not yeah, busy practicing stuff. Um, so that should, be, that should be nice. We've gotten some good suggestions for new names for the show if we do decide to get rid of the Titanforge name. So shout out to everybody who sent in some good ones there. Some of our favorites. Um, let's see, my favorite one that we've gotten so far is Feet of Strength. There are a couple other good ones on this list, though. Do you guys have any favorites uh, that got sent in? I like the weekly no lever. That one's really funny, but I, I don't. Okay, so basically, our reason, our rationale for changing it was that we didn't feel like Titan Forge would embody what is current WoW. Weekly no lever, also kind of not 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 direct. I don't know if it's direct enough, right? I think that's yeah. If we were changing, it would be for like you know search engine reasons, right? It's because we, we'd want people searching for WoW podcasts to find it, right? And weekly no lever, maybe um, also doesn't accomplish that, but it's a really good name. Really funny. <laughs> Titan Forge, a wild podcast. Yeah. Mm. There's a, no Lever is really funny. It's though. really funny. It might be just funny <laughs> enough to be worth it. I don't know. It, it, it may be funny enough to where we just take it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that, that's, uh, that's definitely some good options there. Um, if we do make that change, it'll be somewhere down the line, though. For now, for now we're sticking with Titan Forge. Uh, it's just, you know, Titan Forging has been confirmed to be going away, so... That's that's sad news for our, our our title, our podcast title. I don't know. What what did you guys think of corruption versus titan forging? Now that we've kind of we kind of know that both are never coming back. Titles. Do you have any uh, preference between any of those systems? I think corruption is more fun to play with if you have good corruption. I think corruption is more frustrating. I I do also uh, view corruption as something that i dislike greatly because it gives people a way to complain about their gear more and blame their their low damage on corruption and i am never a fan of that i always prefer to be of the mindset that you can always uh self like like look at yourself and introspectively improve by just improving your gameplay as opposed to just complaining about gear so i don't know i i think corruption is cool though i think it's been like fun to play my class being like mega overpowered and have ten thousand haste try how about you it's when you say that uh I like fundamentally disagree. I, I hate complaining about taking more damage, but I think corruption is too powerful. And like the fact that I can't get certain corruptions on my brewmaster still is really frustrating. And I just take more damage than some other players. Yeah, like the vitality stuff and the versatile. Yeah. Well, well, I'm a DPS, so it's like a little bit different, I would say. Yeah, I think the corruption has done some. There, there were some good parts to the system, but I'm kind of excited to go back to just gear. You know. Not I am having excited anything, to... just being. Do you ever too. have to look at an auction house and think, "Oh shit, this item is corrupted"? Yeah, the auction house things with this tier were. I think that probably the most offensive thing about corruption was the fact that you could spend ten million gold and be like fifty percent more powerful than somebody who didn't in the first couple of weeks. Well, yeah, it's because it's because the gear drops from um, the BOEs are like super RNG too about what corruption it actually rolls. If it's profession based, then it's way more accessible. It's easier to get and it's cheaper. Like, I, I think that's yeah. why we're all. I think that's why professions are different. I do agree with you that corruption was like a, a very common excuse for you know people who it, it, there's like a a mindset of like always improving yourself and you could stop yourself from having to you know admit that you were doing something wrong and just be like oh look that guy's got more corruption than me and it kind of absolves you of actually having to you know take responsibility for doing your stuff right oh uh, yeah i mean i noticed i noticed that i do it on my demon hunter it's not that i blame corruption it's that i know that i'm doing low single target damage so i could potentially fall in the mindset of like oh shit it's just due to corruption i'm pretty sure i'm just not pressing annihilation enough though yeah there, there's like it's almost so rarely are people actually executing their rotations properly over a three minute fight or whatever like almost every time some I've, I've looked at like some log of somebody who sent me in like you know why am i doing less damage than this person with all these corruptions is it just the corruptions it's like it's not it's not just the corruptions almost ever 
sometimes i mean sometimes the corruptions sometimes. mean that like the, it, the pro it, I'm sure on often, average, it's often like, the people with the corruptions are also making mistakes and the corruptions, you know, are, are what makes the difference. But like you can you can still basically always be doing better yourself, um, which is a, a good thing. I, I agree, though, that on the tanking front in particular, like outside of protection warriors and even inside protection warriors, it's it's really stark how tanky you can get with the right corruptions and how much you just get get murdered without them. Um, oh, yeah. So I think that's a, a drawback. And then well, the, and the healing department as well. There's some degeneracy going on with the uh, with Mistweavers. So Mistweavers true. were going to get a, a nerf this week, but they actually held off on delivering it because of uh, player outroar. Should have just nerfed that shit into the ground. There's you know, like I, I knew it was super powerful, and then I looked at a screenshot someone sent me of like the number one Mistweaver logs, and it was like 300k HPS, 400k, 580k HPS on Hive Mind or something. Like, I didn't even know you could take 600k HPS worth of damage yeah. on that. Fight. Yeah, so this is, um, let's see, this is top logs from Nihilotha. This is the maximum parse for each class. So this is people that have their very best corruptions for Mistweaver. Uh, it is cranking these other specs here uh, by a, just a huge margin. But on the other hand, you know, if, if, if you cut down to just like 95th percentile, Things start to look pretty reasonable. 90th percentile, Mistweaver's not even at the top anymore, so... Are there only, like, 10 yeah, there's, Mistweavers shit in the world? There's that? not very many that have this gear. It's it's pretty it's pretty rare. Um, and I, I think that there's some reasonable complaining from, like, other Mistweavers that are like, look, we, you know, the spec is, is in a pretty fun place right now. It's pretty good. And the nerf that destroys the top parses also destroys everybody else. Uh, who aren't doing anything wrong, like who don't need to be nerfed. So I, I think that's, it makes that, sense that to shit should have been nerfed. Like I, the 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 art. Okay, so basically the major argument is it's the end of the expansion. Just let it happen. That's I not fucking a, hate that argument. That's that's, that's not argument. the argument at all. the The argument is that yes, we should fix this right. The 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 top parse being this high, but we shouldn't fix the fact that like mist weavers have a fun fist weaving spec right now that is not broken everywhere except for if you have. You know, five expedient corruptions uh, when when it starts to be able to do this. There is there. So I, I think I think that there's you know it's it's reasonable for them to like find a different nerf than than what you've got. You know, you could target cap the um the like like how glimmer's been capped to eight targets. You could do that for like number of mists that you have out, and that accomplishes this without making the build like stop working in mythic plus and uh and or, it, or well. it could be or it could just give diminishing returns or some shit. Yeah. Yeah, there, so there there are other ways for them to nerf this, but definitely the the people I, I I agree with you that they should they should find a way to stop to stop what Ms. Rivers are doing at the top end. Um, yeah. Absolutely. All right. Uh, so that's that's not going to be our main topic though this week. We're going to talk a little bit about Torghast. We're going to talk a little bit about the MDI. We're going to talk a little bit about the whole set of Nihilotha nerfs that came out right in the past couple days and on reset. But before we get to those. We get to thank our supporters over Patreon.com for supporting our show every week. Uh, they are Paul of US Proudmore, King of Skills, VTech XD, Zuko, Ja, Drunk Swede from Legion of Lemmings, Argent Don EU, I Wish I Was Dratnos' Dino Pillow, Thanks Tettles, Heltari, Ishiu, Blue uh, of Emerald Dream, Chromed, Seraphicus, Trekkie, The Marsh Hare, Regulus, Never Nude, Grizz Jam, Chewy, Do You Want to Build a Snow Trell? Peleon, who ran out of jokes for this segment, Coke Dogs Gopher, Worgen Death, more like Worgen Dead, Rude Dinosaur, Rytan of the Guild, the Guild, on Taran Mill, who I think are still recruiting Mage and Warlock, although I guess we, they haven't sent us an update since last week, so maybe they found their Mages and Warlocks, but I uh, imagine they're probably still looking for good ones, so Taran Mill EU. Yeah, thanks so much for the support. I think that's my favorite segment of the show now. The names just get more interesting every week. Yeah, if you're uh, if you're one of those people and you want to get your name changed, either through Discord is an easy way, or if you're not a Discord user, through the Patreon direct message system, uh, we read those as well. Although sometimes it takes a couple days. Um, <laughs> like I I check them before the podcast every week, oh, okay. so you know the, the, it'll be up to date, but you, you won't get like a, an immediate reply usually. All right, um, so let's talk about the MDI. So. We just had the first North America's and Oceanic Cup this past weekend. Uh, congratulations to Method NA, who got a first place victory. 
at Ethical, who took a map off of them in the Grand Finals in Ataldazar, uh, and earned a second place. Which, that was the first time a map was taken off of a method team so far in this MDI, so... Uh, shout out to Ethical for doing that. Yeah, uh, honestly, I was kind of surprised with the how competitive NNOC were. I, I had a high suspicion that it was going to be just kind of a blowout, but uh, the top four looked really good. Honestly, looked like they had potential. Uh, the rest of the teams, I think there was a lot to... I think that it'll just end up taking time for the rest of the teams to be able to be a little bit more well-rounded. I think Big Dumb Gaming could have been pretty good. Um I think there I think there are a lot of teams that could have just I think with more times and more like more time and more weeks, they'll probably be able to pre be pretty solid. Yeah, I'm looking forward to to hopefully seeing you know the competition continue to be rising in those lower seeds, but I agree with you that the the top four seeds of the North American Cup were more competitive than the top four seeds of the European Cup, I'd say. Like the odds that a, the fourth seed was gonna have an interesting game against the first seed, I think were much higher in the in America than they were in. Uh, Europe, which is cool to watch. Over yeah, in Europe, uh, though, Method EU looks so good. I, I think the I think the biggest deal was like, uh, like out of the top four teams, Goosey Bad and Complexity Limit didn't look like mega consistent. Ethical seemed like they were like pretty consistent for the most part, but like Goosey Bad and Complexity Limit, they looked like they had six strategies that could match time wise versus uh, Method NA and even Ethical, but like. Just their consistency seemed a little bit lacking overall. Yeah, complexity limit though, they they are like so new to this where it, it seems like they still haven't hit diminishing returns on their practice time in the same way that you know other teams might have. So I, I I'd expect them to, to see them like jump up in, in performance next week as well. Charles, do you have anything that you thought about it or anything to add? No, I think it was it was pretty good showing for many. They had like four to five good teams, like you said, and they were more balanced than I would have. I think several of them are still ramping. Max has said they're ramping in like eight tweets in a row or something. <laughs> yeah. Um, I th unfortunately, on their second day there last weekend, they, they had the down ramp instead of the up ramp, but that's okay. <laughs> I'm sure they'll find oh, the yeah. up ramp for next time. I also enjoyed watching three teams bug out the eels and shrine and reset the boss or drop threat and get their team killed by bullshit that shouldn't be in the game. Do you have any tips to how to avoid that beyond just taking it a little bit slower than the teams have been? Or you just well, the tank has to sit in the water. You mm -hmm. have to watch every single eel. You have to let yourself accumulate stacks that you obviously don't want, but you kind of have to get. And then once they're all on you, you can leave. Yeah. You gotta really watch the pathing of like every single eel to make sure they don't go through the ground and get stuck. There's a few of those eels that are like uh, the problem eels, and they they have these like little patrols before you pull them. And you can kind of tell if they're going to be in that terrain when you pull them. And then you have to just make sure that, that you're not pulling them through the terrain. You're pulling them out of the terrain. Yeah. Uh, did you guys see that clip of the uh, per the perplexed one where Swag is like sitting in front of the eel and the eel just gets dragged into like the yeah. depths of the underworld? That one, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that one in particular did not look like there. That was one where the team was actually like playing around the eels properly and it just still yeeted through the floor that one i just yeah, want to have hyper aware of it. yeah that's but, why i have a problem with it because even though it's a bug and you can kind of play around it sometimes it just like it'll bug anyway even if you're a really good player divine field and the shines team are all super experienced players and they still had it happen to them here right. I, I i just grabbed it right now i'm gonna link it in chat uh, you can pull it up right now okay yeah it's, this is the uh the, the it's banana oh, it's so bad Okay, yeah, uh, I guess I can go full screen on this. Uh, whoop. Yeah, you can see just uh, that eel just dropping through the floor there. Literally, whenever I said banished into the underworld, it just... <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like, gone. okay, bro. You know, the funny thing is, I, I just don't think they've been aware of this. And I don't know if they'll, st they'll still not fix it now, but there is a different boss room entirely for the Crucible of Storm. Like, the outside edges of that room are flat. And all they'd have to do is just substitute that terrain for the bugged, craggy terrain that's there now, and it probably would fix all the issues. Well, okay, I I, I think that like actually substituting terrain would be of a problem. I think if they made like an invisible wall there, I think it might just, have been just make the eel snap ones. instead of evade. Bang. <laughs> True. You know, I think I think I accept that. Never mind. You're right. The snap and instead of evade. There's, there's a couple ways they could fix it. I just don't think they're aware of it. 
All right, another thing that we have seen showing up in this MDI has been a massive amount of hunters. We haven't seen all of it yet, though, on the broadcast. Allow me to show you the King's Rest time trials for the cup that's coming up this weekend. The Titanforge podcast also seeing an immense amount of hunters. Yes, as King's now Rest. all three of us have one. Yeah, we're all playing hunter. That's of true. the um, of the top eight teams, that's twenty four DPS players for the King's Rest time trial. Twenty two of them were hunters. There was one rogue nice. and one demon hunter in these top eight what? runs. But why isn't there a mage? Demon hunter. Yeah, it's completely wild. Um, this is so. It's you won't see this always in King's Rest, but tyrannical bolstering King's Rest. That's a perfect hunter environment in this dungeon. Well, Kara is also like one of the best dungeons for hunter by a significant amount, right, Trail? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And workshop. Yeah, workshop King's Rest. The, you know, single targety dungeons good for hunter, but. Uh, Tyrannical bolstering in particular makes it really good for Hunter. Uh, we don't see... Th it's not like this for the other dungeons, though. It's, you know, D DKs in Underrot and uh, and in Shrine. DKs, Hunters, DHs. So there's there's some mix in the other dungeons, but in King's Rest it is Hunters all the way down. So yeah, that's uh, that's going to be an interesting thing. It's, it's kind of like dungeons can either be like really DK heavy, really Hunter heavy, or they can be kind of a mix. Uh, oh yeah, the really DK heavy ones involve a demon hunter as well. Often a demon hunter, yeah. How do you feel about like the no rogue keys? I, I think we've seen a lot of no rogue uh, this MDI. I'm actually kind of a fan. Yeah, rogue is just it's, it's preload damage. Yeah, Arrow, honestly. Arrow literally DM'd me after they lost the upper final to Method NA. He's like, dude, rogue sucks. He's like, rogue is just so fucking bad right now. It, it, he's like, it's the worst version of hunter. It just sucks. That's like you don't need shroud. Like shroud is not saving you any serious amount of time in any dungeons, um, and their damage just does not has not scaled very well. And they, you know the nerfs have really come and started to hurt. So yeah, I, I agree. I'm, I I'm okay. I'm okay with the spot that rogue is in personally. I think it's like fine. Yeah, I mean rogue's still showing up. Like there's, I think there's a rogue in. I guess, I guess there's only two rogues in the total top eight of time trial teams or times, but still. Like, that's more than we're seeing of many classes that don't make it into MDI at all. Big truth right there. True. And we've seen so much of them in previous MDIs. I'm, I'm, fi I'm fine with Rogue. Like, I don't think Rogue needs is something they need to look at right now uh, to yeah, buff anything. The, the MDI consensus is that Rogue is definitely not the best damage, and if you can get away without it, that's definitely the play. I think it's just, based on my limited experience this season and many others' experience going on, I think playing without a Rogue just causes a lot of challenges that people aren't used to having like just just more threat challenges in general how to gather packs that are very spread apart with tricks and snap points without a rogue can be pretty hard like hunter has misdirect but it's not even close to what yeah if rogue tricks triple hunter though you don't have anybody who's going to be getting threat so threat problems go away again as well all right um one thing we also saw was more teams kiting obelisks in more dungeons than freehold so Dude, yeah in Ataldazar, we saw Ethical kiting the uh, Awakened Enemies against Yasma. This was in their upper finals where they ended up losing to Method NA, but they won this map against Method NA in the grand finals, uh, kiting the Obelisks this way. I think that is the... Is, oh, that's not the grand final, that's the upper final. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I can't remember which one I linked. Inertia was doing that too, right, Charl? If yeah, we were. Ataldazar time, Charl? We had a nice little 12-12 Atal at one point. But uh, it's pretty funny doing that with the last boss. It actually lowers the boss kill time by like 30 to 45 seconds, having the healer kite those around. Yeah, I mean, so the the downside is that the healer is not able to DPS, right? But the right. upside is the fact that you don't have to put any damage on the obelisks. And you can just blow it up with... Uh, just blow it up. I was kind of surprised that Method NA didn't kite obelisks, personally. Especially with their 11... It was 11.45 in time trials. I was like... Yeah, you were 95% sure out. that they had been kiting obelisks in that run because of I how mean, fast dude, their time it, was. 11.45 is so insane to not ha like be putting any damage into those obelisks. I thought it was just like not really reasonable. Yeah. I think I think it may have been like they they probably wanted to, but it's the feeling of what if they ban the strat for next weekend? We should probably just keep practicing the guaranteed strat that's going to work. And especially if it's going to be out of 20, like you need to practice those even more. I, that was probably their mindset last week at least now it's a little bit different with no 20s yeah so speaking of that 20 so the the grand finals of the first two cups were played 
on plus 20s, but going forward, back down to plus 19s. So uh, this is going to be... The player. The player's pretty happy about this, uh, of course. It's going to keep the you know competition on the same keys, so you, you only have, uh, I guess, 11 total maps to practice, and you don't have to kind of worry about practicing a new set of slightly different maps for the Grand Finals. Um, on the other hand... You could make a strong argument that, you know, Ethical lost to Method NA on the plus 19 and they were able to win on the plus 20. Uh, in, you know, that 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 win may have been due to it being a plus 20 even. The, the fact that, like, Method NA had problems that they wouldn't have had on a plus 19, probably. Probably, yeah. I think that's bad, though. It's just, like, it just creates more of a... Like, more things that could go wrong and possibly favor the team with less practice, you know? I don't know. I don't know what to be like what to think about having 20s in. I think it's always bad to have different key levels in general. Yeah. Well, the most hype of MDIs had, like, it went 23, 24, 25. Well, I thought it was 20, 22, think... 24. Was that? No, no, no. no. That, well, that was time trials. Ah, okay. <laughs> and then and then the, the cup play was 22, 23, 24. And then the grand fi- like the the global finals, which saw like the most viewership of any MDI so far, went twenty four, twenty five, twenty six. Huh. I do remember that. <laughs> I remember someone wiping in like a twenty six C for. Gr- so okay, long. Gr- granted, those maps were pooled in into ways where you couldn't like it, it, you didn't lose just all your practice because you'd only be practicing on one level. But I don't know. I, I think that that formatting was strictly worse, even though it. To give every viewership, oh, yeah. so I don't think you can look at it like that. Yeah, so th- there's a little bit of a trade off here. For instance, so let's talk a little bit about the Twitter poll. Uh, there's been a lot of complaints about the Twitter polling for affixes. Right now, we have one that's active for uh, Toldegore, a fortified Toldegore. The options being Quaking Necrotic, Raging Teeming, Sanguine Volcanic, or Bursting Skittish. Um, and the winner of this poll right now is, let's take a look at what's doing it. Yeah, it's, it's Sanguine Volcanic that's very likely to win this in the next three hours, unless a thousand people come by and vote for Raging Teeming real quick. Um, what do you guys think about the outcry against these polls? Let's let Trail fill this one. I think he's the most outspoken. I don't care personally. <laughs> well, I don't really care anymore, but I, when I was competing, it is, it is very bad as a competitor to see a poll with like, three sets of really awful affixes and you know it's going to be one of those affixes like you just know because everybody wants to cause the crazy key to happen on stream where everybody wipes like three times and has 20 deaths on each team you know but the competitors just want something that keeps the dungeon in like a big pole state where you can go you pretty much go to the first boss with all the trash then you go to the second boss with all the trash then you go to the third boss with like one giant cannon pull and told the core but this this week's poll is actually kind of tame. Like the Sanguine Volcanic as the winner is pretty good on it. It's not really the, too bad in an MDI set. Like just Sanguine as the hard affix is really not too bad. But the future weeks could mean that since they're doing these polls, the Blizzard could pull like a Bursting Necrotic set on someone. And then obviously the whole community would vote for Bursting Necrotic, if that makes sense. Yeah, I agree that it seems like the community is pretty much always going to be picking the hardest affixes of the four. Uh, that are that are offered and definitely causes a lot of players to um, to see you know to to say things that, that they don't like it you know stop doing this stop doing this uh, talking about how it's going to get auto banned and stuff um, <laughs> which I I think that this is not going to get auto banned I don't think that Sanguine Volcanic the Toldegore j- is an auto ban the junkyard one was definitely uh, the junkyard from NAOC weekend was definitely an auto ban because it just take too it yeah, takes the, too much time. The problem with bolstering oh, yeah. junkyard is that like you you practice it for six hours and you don't get very much reliability out of those six hours of practice, right? But with Sanguine Toldegore, like especially given that you can practice this now and you don't know what the other maps are going to be, I feel like teams should be practicing this. Yeah, that one's not, really not bad. Not planning to ban this, like I if you if you just practice this a lot and you force the other team to ban it against you, then that's the competitive advantage. So uh, I don't think that, I don't think this is going to be an auto ban or anything. I think that that's reasonable. I, I don't know. I also think that um, these kind of polls, like MDI players want 
they're they want the dungeon to just be like no affixes right they want it yeah. to be oh yeah they want it to be Definitely. uh fortify or i guess they want it to be like tyrannical teeming volcanic or whatever tyrannical teeming skittish something like that uh and they just want to run through the dungeon and pull all the all the mobs onto bosses but for viewership purposes there's you know a good argument for having some affixes that are not free right that are, are more complicated more challenging and for viewership purposes like voting on a poll and then going to watch and see what happens in the poll that you voted in that's good for viewership too and mdi players want there to be like prizes for the mdi and they want the I, mdi it, to continue right and that viewership is a very important part of those two things happening so there's got to be a balance here i think squishy put it best it's like the the two most hype moments of an mdi is whenever somebody does something that is like unforeseen and is like super spectacular like kiting the awakened mods that's like the first one we've seen in like a while where it's like a super pog moment the alternative is like when teams are turbo feeding that's also really funny like it, th there are, there are two moments that are memorable in mbi and it's those two and uh the turbo feed is far more likely than the the super pog moment especially that's after the first true. week yeah you only remember the extreme goods and the extreme bad yeah which is crazy because like as a competitor you want the dungeons to be like just as fast as possible as few polls and then as a viewer you want the complete opposite you like you want to see some interesting stuff changes well, in the well i don't know well it, even in like traditional sports that's how it is too like uh, the most hype moments are like either the things that like secure the win or two teams just like fiesting the whole entire time like, yeah you, like even in like in football they have like all these miraculous moments like the like the uh immaculate reception and shit like that but then there will be Stuff like the ice bowl where fucking teams just neither team scored. Like neither team fucking scored. It was like super stupid shit. Yeah, or like high scoring games. Or like, like the butt fumble and shit. Like there, there's so much from football too where it's like mega troll plays that just get played on repeat. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Although I think the one that flies under the radar is you like to see very close games, like mm -hmm. matches in MDI where the teams are five seconds apart and the both bosses are like ten percent at the same time and they have a similar amount of deaths. Those are very exciting. And I think those are more possible if affixes are are more regular and they're less uh, punishing. That's the word I'm looking for. And the key level is the same. Because like, if you have those factors, the games are generally going to be closer, or you hope to see they're closer at least. All right. Uh, let us advance through our podcast now to the other topics. <laughs> um, but first, we have our tip of the week segment. Uh, so my tip of the week is about using your residuum this season. And basically, I, I want to suggest that if there's only one Azerite piece for you that's an upgrade, saving up to buy specific makes more sense this season than it did last season. Um, the price is the same between, for buying specific and for buying random, but there's an extra piece in the pool now. So the odds of getting that one good piece have fallen from buying random Azerite. Uh, quite dramatically, from from a sixth to a seventh. So, so math mathematically, last season, if there was only one piece that was an upgrade for you, you would have rather have saved up. So the fact that there was one more added, if there's only one piece that's an upgrade, yeah, like Dretnus is saying, you should save up. In addition to that, uh, since the season is super long, there's no like desire where you like need the piece now. Where like uh, previously, like a lot of the reason that you would rather buy random is because you get the piece immediately. Mm -hmm. so it's not like super time gated so you'd rather just buy it immediately and just hope but yeah, yeah i think it, i agree with that it, it depends on your exact circumstances like if you have two good pieces and five bad ones it, it can be a close decision um but it's definitely more favorable to buying specific than it was last season when i i thought gambling was like almost always the right move all right trail what is your tip of the week my tip of the week is about the dodge card from last season. If anyone remembers the uh, trajectory analysis red punch card from Mechagon. And it still works off of Necrotic the same way where once you stack it up to 99 stacks, which happens pretty quickly, uh, you get like 10 to 25% dodge chance. And that's pretty. It's a pretty good option for Necrotic week. I think you could sub out when you're healing trinkets as a tank. You're like as a brewmaster, you play Urchin and the Nazal trinket this season. And you could probably swap out your Urchin for that as a good choice. Yeah, Urchin pretty nerfed on Necrotic anyways, right? Exactly. It's a win-win. Vitality Conduit Major, good for healers this week, too. So, uh, it's also something else that can be super useful. All right, let us advance now to Tettles' tip of the week, which, of course, has been turned into Clip of the Week. Why do you say this every single time? <laughs> I just want to update people on the other situation, why we're doing... Not, why your tip is never a tip, but it's just us watching TV. 
Let's watch some TV, though. This is uh, the 72nd <laughs> floor of Torghast. You guys fighting against the Terra Gru. And it gets turned into a chair. Very cool. <laughs> I was like, where the where did he go? I thought he evaded or like snapped to our tank or something. Yeah, so uh, you can see Tettles dying, laughing in the corner. Yep, yep. For those wondering, uh, the Terra Gru is the um, that's the like timed mechanic of Torghast. So we'll talk more about how Torghast works later. But you're not supposed to be able to kill that thing. That's um, that's something that they're trying to fix. So there's been some new alpha build that is trying to make that so that doesn't happen. But people, of course, are still gonna try and kill that thing. Uh, as much as possible. All right, uh, so before we talk about Torghast, though, we have some Nihilapa nerfs. Uh, so there's been two, there were two kind of posts with different sets of nerfs to it. We can go sort of boss by boss here and talk about these. Uh, so we have Drestigath. Drestigath is 8% health nerf to everything except for Drestigath itself. Uh, Tettles, you got any opinions about this one? Well, I mean, I don't... Higher end guilds were already just kind of standing around waiting for like waiting yeah. for new tentacles to spawn. So this one is definitely going to make that a war shirt where you just kind of stand there. Kind of need just a gong to make the next wave of attendees spawn or something. Like uh, back in <laughs> Gate of the Setting Sun. Ilganoth. 5% uh, health on organs and bloods. Damage requirement to free an allied player from mind control was reduced by 10%. And the Corrupted Blood Maximum Radius was reduced by 10%. Now this one has had a couple of interesting side effects. So when this fix was first put out for the first like 12 hours of the, of the reset, Corrupted Blood was just not doing any damage because it was not reaching the... So they, they coded down how big it got, but it was still set to explode at that maximum radius from before that it was never reaching anymore. They fixed that. But now what's happening is it's pulsing more often because it's... It's growing and shrinking at the same speed, but it's hitting this, the maximum size at a, a shorter time now. So the damage taken actually across the raid from the Cursed Pulses is now higher in our logs than it was before because the, the, the radius being increased by 10% is effectively a 10% increase in how often this damage comes out, uh, which is wild. So <laughs> that's, a, that's a fun accidental buff here that they it seems like they did to Ilganoth. I'm not sure if that's... It's gonna stick around for a long time. Another thing we noticed with this bug, or with this fix, was that our friends aren't getting healed when we're breaking them out of the mind control anymore. It used to be that they'd get like full healed when we broke them out of the mind control, Are but now they they're just, just oh my God. staying at like 30% that's health, an, yeah. That's an awful fix. <laughs> that's a terrible fix. I, I haven't killed that, that's the only boss that we have left the farm this week. Uh, that, that sucks. Yeah, here, hang on. Let me. I'm gonna go take a look into our logs and see see if I can find for I'm you. I'm gonna watch Kiyo do the boss later. But yeah, uh, unfortunately, Ilganoth has, has it. It seems like the nerfs were sort of accidentally buffs uh, here. So that's um, that's pretty cool. I'm gonna yeah, let me... might might mess around and accidentally buff a boss. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, I have some logs here to just confirm this real quick. Well, it's to entice you to dispel, right? That's why... Yeah, I, well, it doesn't really entice you to dispel. It just means you don't have to spread as much with it. Like, this doesn't ha change the dispel strategy very much at all because the minimum size is still the same. But the time that it takes is, like, quicker, so you're taking more damage overall, right? Yeah. 10% uh... more, right? Okay. So yeah, here. Yeah, plus you plus you can't dispel as quickly because people are. I don't know. It's gonna be. It, you're gonna have to have people on different like. So here's you're gonna have our. To be more aggressive with your dispelling. Here's our kill from yesterday. Cursed pulse damage taken, ended up being 107 million damage in a seven minute and twenty second fight. And here's our kill from last week. Thirty seconds longer fight, and we only took 101 million damage from cursed pulse. So we took six extra million damage over 30 less seconds of fight from Cursed Falls, uh, thanks to this nerf to the boss fight. So they, um, they very much looks like they accidentally buffed the fight here for us, which you do love to see. Uh, okay, we've got some other Nihilotha changes though. So besides the Ilganoth ones, which have been a little buggy, we have uh, Raw Den. Decaying Wound has been nerfed by a quarter in terms of how much damage it's gonna do to the tank. So that's pretty nice. That's the last phase that's a good thing. One. That's yeah, a good that's a good yeah, one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then Very then... good for guilds just getting to that boss. That's a really tough part to get through once you get to it. If 
a couple times, first couple times. Yeah. Uh, and then they nerfed the health of Essence of Vita, Essence of Void, and Essence of Nightmare by a large amount as well. Which uh, I think also makes a lot of sense. I don't know, Rodan was one of my favorite fights this uh, this patch, actually, this this tier. I think there's a lot of good mechanics in it. Rod Rod there's a lot of moving parts. Was tuned very well, too. Yeah. Um, although that, that decaying wound in the last phase... <laughs> Um, here, hang on. Let me let me go and take a look at this last phase. Here, here's our guild's HPS in the last phase of our progression kill with decaying wounds the way that it was back then. Uh, it, it went it went like taunt immune, so I was just kind of tanking the whole thing back there. Uh, so in that last phase, I did 150k HPS as a blood death knight on that nice. boss. Yeah. This is uh so the, this this is be the requirement for this has been reduced now by 25 percent, which is very nice, because this is a boss that goes taunt immune, depending on what you're trying to do to it, what your strategy looks like. Um, or it can, you know, kill tanks pretty easily as well. If you're doing a normal strategy, though, this should really help pretty much everybody as well, not just not just if you're trying to solo tank that last phase. Okay, Nazoth. Paranoia has been kind of buffed here. Kind of nerfed, kind of buffed. It now only drains sanity once per second, instead of once per second per player that you're near. What this means is it's a little bit harder to accidentally go in, or to intentionally go insane at the end as well. Because uh, you would go intentionally insane that's by true. just having everybody stack. Now that's going to take a little bit of time to happen. But other than that, this is this is generally a, a nerf to the fight. Uh, Nazoth's health reduced by 5%. That's the most significant nerf to that fight. Harvest Thoughts is draining 50 less sanity. Doesn't really change anything about that at all. Uh, and Evoke Anguish's damage has been reduced by 15%. Which is a pretty pretty serious nerf. Okay, did you you want to know something? Uh, it's only a, a nerf to the initial damage, not to the dot. Yeah, which is wild. Which is fucking stupid. Yeah, I, I noticed that as well. I was like, this is still hurting just as much. The um, the ticks. Yeah, I, I, uh, you know. <laughs> I didn't realize that. Nerf That's to the funny. initial damage. Okay, I guess fifteen percent nerf to the dot. Very big nerf. I will admit. I'm surprised. I think it's a bug. I, yeah, yeah, I think this is supposed to hit the dot as well, but it hasn't. Um, the initial damage is, is like kind of the least important part as well, because like most much of those initial damage hits are covered by you know barrier or or, or link or something from most strategies, uh, whereas the dot itself is when you're spreading out and is what kills people. So yeah, um, kind of a wild set of nerfs here. There's some more though, but wait, there's more. Uh, they fixed the Cujo bug in Mechagon Workshop, so that's good. Oh, fuck. <laughs> Xanesh, 5% health nerf and cast time increase to 5.5 seconds instead of 5 on the interrupts. That, that stopped me from wiping our raid last night, so I'm pretty happy about that. Because uh, I, I got my oh, interrupt really? in the last 0.5 seconds. You know, <laughs> panic realized I had an interrupt and got it. So uh, <laughs> thank you for this nerf in particular, Blizzard Entertainment. That uh, did really good things for me. Shadhar, they gave you a little bit more time to pick up the food, and they increased the travel time of the Umbral Eruption, okay? And Hive Mind, 10% health on the darters, and 10% damage on the darters, also nerfed. Um, so this is a huge set of nerfs to most bosses in Nihilotha. Almost all of the ones past those first three have gotten some kind of nerf. What do you guys think about this kind of sweeping set of nerfs here? Uh, I'm honestly okay with it. They're opening up... Uh... They're opening up Nihilith to be cross realm. Everybody's able to get in there. Um, it's becoming more pug friendly. It's just becoming a little bit easier to be able to slap together a group that's not the most coordinated mythic guild and be able to down some of the bosses, like Shadhar, like Hive Mind, uh, like the like those encounters to be able to just kind of kill them pretty quickly. Vexiona is probably pretty, still pretty easy too. I yeah, Vexiona, no ner no nerfs to Vexiona. I don't think I would go ahead and go to Xanesh if I was in like a pug or something, but like Yeah, that'd be hard to get past. Yeah. Xanesh prob is probably Shadhar and Hive Mind, but like five five of twelve pugs pretty realistic now. And then maybe like Rod Den is something I you can't even really do Rod Den. Or like Dressagath Rod Den and Xanesh when when those are the bosses that are active in each wing at that point. Probably probably when to call it quits in your pug. Unless you guys are really owning. And then, yeah, the Nazoth nerf should be good for guilds working on that as well. Uh, they, yeah. they, they keep kind of trying to touch this Thought Harvester sanity thing, but I don't, this is not going to fix the immunities. Like, th this is not going to make it so that you don't need immunities to do this. Um, the sanity the is not the way, problem. 
The only way that they fix the Thar Harvesters is if you get two per set instead of three. They're like two per uh, like round. I don't even know what to describe it. Phase, I guess. I mean, you you just yeah you you gotta you gotta do some damage nerfs like nerf the dot of evoke anguish as well. Maybe nerf some of the overlaps with the harvest thoughts, and then make it so you can't immune it. Just you make it not immunable. Um, I feel like that would be the the solution to the thought harvester immunity stacking. <laughs> we we got ironic in the chat throwing some some shade at warlocks. Did you guys know that my warlock got a expedient piece from my box this week? No. Pretty nice. Pretty nice. Ratna summon rising. I remember when Zyronic was a big warlock mythic plus streamer. Yeah. Yeah, whatever he played with Hadrian and Waffle Sauce. Yeah, and Luffy. I do remember that whenever he also <laughs> did with Fired Up, but now he's just a hater. I don't understand where how far he's fallen. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, that's um this is it's sad to see, really. It's kinda it's kind of the um Watching these Warlock Mythic Plusers, it's, it's just like watching them go through the five stages of grief, right? They're all kind of... He's kind of just this phase where he's lashing yeah. out. And, Some yeah. of them are still in denial, like Shelly. Still playing like, World. It's like Moonkin Mythic Plusers, too. Moonkin Mythic Plusers, yeah, you guys are just... Actually, it's it, you kind of went through it a little bit in Season 2, as well. We're all just depressed and do no damage, and everybody's re-rolled off of it. Or just season 3, Moonkin was good. That was just last season. It was okay. It was yeah. pretty good. Yeah, I'm a fan of these nerfs, though, the, the Nihilo, the nerfs. I think that's a good set of changes to the raid. Just nerfing it over time makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, I agree. I, I, think, I think now is a good time. I think, I think it's, since it's being opened across Realm, I think it's a decent time. And it's like, all right. Oh, yeah, sure. It's not that everybody can get a cutting edge kill, but like everybody should be able to have fun. Yeah. Kind of thing. All right, let's talk a little bit about Torghast. So since our last podcast, Torghast opened up. Tettles and I have got alpha access. And Trell does not. We're sorry, Trell. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> feels bad, man. We don't, we don't have that kind of clout, bro. Yeah, we, we don't have enough clout to currently bring Trell along to the alpha. But, you know, if everybody keeps watching our show and sharing it with all your friends, we might get big enough where we can get the whole podcast in next time. For next Channel me your clout. I want to play alpha. Yeah, please send us as much clout as you have. We need it badly. Poor Trell over here. It's <laughs> one drop of clout is all we need. Um, so DH and all the clothies were the classes you could play on Torghast so far. And it's been really fun. It's this roguelike dungeon crawler wow experience. Um, Tettles, you and I have done quite a few different runs of them. I think between us, we've played all the different classes and many of the different specs. Um, and you kind of, it, it, right now it's got this dynamic where you start off pretty weak in each of your runs and then you get some power-ups and then you get really overpowered and just steamroll over the rest of the run. Uh, I feel like that should be maybe tuned a little bit. They should maybe make the, the later floors, I don't know, scale up faster depending on what level you're at um, to make it so that they keep up with how, how overpowered you're getting. But it's hard because like, you know, on some runs you get like 500% more powerful by the fifth floor and on some runs you get 10,000 percent more powerful or whatever and it's uh <laughs> well it's like you and i were doing whenever we were uh messing around it's like oh got that buff zone out <laughs> yeah we did we did that one time we were like hey these aren't fun get me out of here we start again uh from just like because you got you start with a buff you start with one anno power it's very fun though it's it's a very fun system um tettles how have you been liking it just kind of overall uh I think it's interesting. I think okay. So for me personally, I think it will get boring fairly quickly because I because it, it won't be my preferred form of content. Um, I think for other people, it will be pretty cool. I do have major concerns for people who play stuff like healers as like their main spec. So like tanks and DPS, it's it, it's very similar to horrific visions in that regard, where it's like for tanks and DPS, it's not exactly the most difficult thing as long as you have like a really good understanding of your class, you're able to kind of get through every single level. Uh, just kind of slog through the first couple levels and be able to get through it. If you're playing a healer, I don't know how the hell you actually do it, It like, solo. I, I think that it should be accessible to everybody solo, personally. Maybe maybe that's a bad philosophy for somebody that's playing a healer, though. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't actually done a healer run. You can play, like, Holy Priest and, and Disc Priest in there. I assume Disc is pretty good at it. Like, you can heal yourself you think a lot. Maybe they'll do the same balancing changes they did to Visions, where they make everything have significantly less health for healers. The and thing then, is, like, just, tanks have a little heal Healers have so few mechanics that work in, like, a Holy Priest, right? Like, you have so few buttons that do something in a Torghast situation, right, by default. So I think that's, <laughs> like, even if you just nerf their health and damage by a lot, all the enemies in there, I, I don't know how you make that really fun. For, but the, on the other hand, there's the enemy powers. The enemy powers are, like, 
really interesting. So you, you find these things in Torghast that like make your spec do all kinds of weird stuff. Um, so like my warlock was summoning demons instantly. Uh, I had the corruption slow ring from Legion. Unending resolve was permanent oh, yes. on me. Um, I was doing all kinds of wild stuff. And my shadow priest was like building up damage onto my next auto attack. So I would just walk up with like a hundred stacks of this thing and auto attack and one shot things um, with my, with my <laughs> priest awesome. just bop them. Um, there's, so there, there's all kinds of cool, you know, animal powers that do different things for different specs in cool ways. I think that they need to make sure that they design some that are like really transformative for solo healers um, to make sure that some, they, yeah. Something that I immediately, immediately noticed that was also going to be a problem is the fact that there's no timer. So like, if you really wanted to, you could wait out like every, you could like metamorphosis every single pack. That would be kind of weird. I don't know. I don't know what the, the circumstances which you would do that would be, but like you could technically uh, do that if you really wanted to, or just like any other cooldown. And the fact that if you wanted to run up 72 floors, it took four hours. Yeah, so the the, <laughs> the timing, like, we, we don't know how Torghast is actually going to work on live, like, what floors you're going to do in a run for a normal thing. But, like, you were getting legendary components every six floors, right? Um, so that seems like kind of the unit of amount of floors, maybe, that you'll, you'll be doing runs of, or 12 or something. I'm not sure. Um, but I think that... Yeah, I, th I think that the timing thing is a little bit of an interesting thing. Like, I, I think that they may they maybe need to give you like a like an incentive to keep pulling to chain pull that isn't a timer. So instead of like penalizing you for um, for not pulling in a certain amount of time, like giving you a timer that kicks you out or whatever, they should give you like a like the, the way that action games have a combo that you keep up by killing stuff. You know, give you something like the, the thirty second buff that you keep that you keep up by killing things. And it stacks yeah, and stuff, and like good. if that falls off, then you're you're slowed down, and it you know you, you, your incentive is to keep that up more than it is to um, wait for your meta cooldown. True. So on alpha, um, in addition to that, you can start the Torghast at levels one thirteen or twenty five. That will not be the case whenever it goes live too. So imagine if you had to go from floor one to floor seventy two, or like not had to, like you will never have to. Imagine if, if there was incentive, like an incentive to go from floor one to floor seventy two. I don't know. It's just so early to know like what they're gonna pick for the actual experience. I I don't think that they're going to make like a five hour experience something that you need to do for the game. Like, there's just I, I don't think that's something that they're that would looking be at. Awful. I would hate yeah. that so much. I'm like, already I, like worn out just doing three visions a week. That take yeah. like 15, 20 minutes. Each. Pretty pretty sure that the like six floor limit or amount is is what or like twelve for the twelve is what normal and easy are right now. It's just heroic is like uncapped. Like I think I think that they should make sure that the rewards come from like a six or twelve run, and then you can do a infinite run for funsies or whatever if you're a degenerate. But uh, don't make it so that there's any meaningful stuff gated behind that. All right. Um, the difficulty scaling was a little bit off. Hopefully they can get that sorted out where it does. Yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> Right, right now it's basically like the first couple floors of a, a heroic run are really, really, really hard, and then it gets really, really, really easy once you start getting overpowered. And hopefully they can kind of balance that out in some way. Maybe some system that like even looks at how broken your character is and adjusts the floor, the, the next floor accordingly, uh, would There's be worth doing. Feel like linearly, probably. Right, and your character just damage they're doing to pops off after a couple floors. So yeah. Uh, it's gonna be really interesting to see. I, I I got high hopes for this thing. The the thing is like worst case, unless they unless they have something like island level incentives that force us to be in there for like ten hours a day uh, in the first week of a patch, it's hard to imagine this really having a like being negative, right? At worst, it's probably just gonna be like something that you do a little bit of and it's kind of fun, and then you and don't really go back. Eventually, yeah, it's like a, it's like what horrific visions turned into. Like right. the horrific visions were like lit at the very beginning and they kind of got boring, but they were yeah. still lit at one point. So at worst, I think this will be like better than Horrific Visions. At best, I think it could be like a new thing that you that players spend most of their time in, uh, potentially. So that's exciting. I think they're they're onto something fun so far. But yeah, that's Torghast. Um, let's move on to our question and answer segment. So our first question comes from Tabu thirty four in chat, who asks, "What do you think a cup would look like? An MDI cup?" with legitimate high keys. Uh, I don't know if it would be awful or not. Charles, oh. do you have an opinion on what a high key MDI would look like? I know exactly what it would look like. 
So you know how the casters have to like kind of repeat themselves over and over with explaining certain mechanics on bosses? Well, that would just happen like four times as much. Dude, if you if you hit me with a four minute boss to cast, <laughs> I'm going to lose my shit. Like that would be so miserable to do. Like so, wa watching a team like do a high key and hearing their comms. Like whenever you're watching somebody stream and there you hear their comms, it's cool. If if you have casters casting over a team doing a high key. I think that would just be miserable, wouldn't it? Oh yeah! Imagine watching a forty-two minute King's Rest, like a twenty-five King's Rest. That and here comes be... the eighth spit gold of the fight. Let's see who that's going to go on. It goes on the rogue. He's going to walk back and drop it off at the edge of the room. And they're going to go and keep attacking the golden serpent. <laughs> oh, oh my goodness! And their rogue procked a twisted appendage, and he's using blood of the enemy to be able to do enhanced damage via that twisted appendage. Look at him go up. 3k DPS on the damage beater currently. Yeah, so that, that that that's a problem with high keys in the MDI. Another problem with high keys in the MDI is like you make the keystone level too high, and teams are like the the odds that it's a close match kind of go down because the odds that just somebody really scuffs it go up dramatically, right? Like you can even just look like East Cup Kings Rest last season, right, where teams were depleting there. It's like when when the keystone gets to a level where it's depleting. Um, or it's close to the timer. I think it's it stops being. I don't know. I think that there is some exciting space in esports for high key pushing, but I don't think that it is one versus one teams playing on the same map against each other. Yeah, I mean, I think you and I were talking about this yeah. in DMs a couple. Weeks yeah, Tettles and I have some ideas for how to how to make high key pushing in esport, but it's not an MDI style format. Uh, it's a different it's, format. It's definitely very different. Yeah, I, it's just. It would be too boring for both viewers. Like the competitors would probably find it very similar, but like it's hard to like pit teams against one another while uh, they're doing high keys because that's it's not really reasonable. I think it's the best way of putting it. Yeah, I, it, it, dude. Like, okay, think about the times that you walk into King's Rest and you like fucking like lose your run in the first thirty-five seconds, and somebody jokingly goes, "Drop it in two chests," and you all immediately zone out of the instance. Like that's that's what happens so regularly. So watching that for something that's supposed to be like an eSport competition sounds miserable. Yeah, I, I think that's uh, that's how I feel about it too. All right, next question comes from Morsha in Discord. What's the counterplay to somewhat bolstered a tall juggernauts doing their friend their charge thing? Uh, I got one shot on a 17 with two or three bolster stacks towards the end of that pack. Is it just keeping them stunned? I wasn't sure if it was on a regular timer since Big Wigs doesn't have anything for it. Tettles, how do we play around Juggernauts? Uh, so you can do a couple of different things. You can dodge them. Um, their, their charge does have projectile speed, so you are able, like if you're standing far enough away, you can just like even walk out of it. You don't necessarily need a movement speed. Uh, you can use like blinks or disengages or whatever to be able to dodge out of the way of it. Um, if everybody's in melee, they will only pick that player that's at range to charge. I think generally, though, the most agreed upon strategy is snap spots utilizing them um so the priestess alunza one priestess alunza has two different snap spots in her room that you can use uh, i i assume that Dranus is probably gonna show this videos shortly uh <laughs> oh did you put did you oh wait are these videos that you put in here all right yeah, yeah i have videos here uh, okay. so basically there are two snap spots that in priestess alunza's room where if that person is the only person that is at range um then they will cancel the they will cancel their charge uh, keeping them in melee. Of course, the spot like on the stairs at the very beginning of the instance is fairly well known, but that one, those two spots are not exactly the most well known. Yeah, yeah so you can tell you're in the the right spot because you'll see the juggernaut actually cast the merciless assault. He'll like finish the cast and then just not move for a sec, and that means he tried but he couldn't. It's right here where Tettles is is kind of the common space for fighting this pack, uh, and back here the jug yeah the juggernauts won't have a path to charge at you, but they'll try. And you just you just have to make sure you're fighting the pack somewhere in range where like you, you fight him at the top of the stairs so that Tettles is in range here. Uh, that's mm -hmm. absolutely a common move. The other option is the brazier. Yeah, you were talking about in the front of the room, but this is it's a little bit. This isn't one that usually gets used for the for that middle pack because it's kind of far away from them. But yeah, good uh, good videos, Tettles. <laughs> I was I was wondering what those ones were in there. I should have looked. I saw, I saw your face whenever I said that. And I realized <laughs> that you did fact did not have them open. I was like, oh no. That's all right. We got him. We got him eventually. Yeah. So that's oh, yeah. 
you should know that all four of the other players that aren't in a staff spot should be right in melee range of the Juggernaut as well. Yes. They have to target and someone at range. Totems, Magic of the Dead, pets. All of those things can bait the Juggernauts as well. So if you have a Magus the Dead that's like eight yards away from your group casting, they'll charge that Magus and anybody who's too close to it's going to get killed as well. So uh, you got to be careful. If you're playing a hunter, make sure that you put your hunter pets on like uh, stay here mode uh, to where like because you need them to stay on the ground to be able to for you to be able to deal damage. So make sure you position them before you hop in the spot as well. Yeah, there a tall like if you're using snap spots and Taltazar, there's a lot of hunter micro involved if you're if you're that BM hunter. Mm -hmm. Alright, next question comes from Honey Honey on Discord. I'd love to hear a discussion on how the upper bracket in MDI can be reduced, or even if you think it's a problem. It feels like having to play in the lower bracket to reach the grand finals puts the lower bracket team, who's already the underdog, at an even bigger disadvantage with the extra time the upper bracket finalist has to practice the plus 20 maps. So first off, the plus 20s are gone now, but even before then, uh, the upper bracket team hasn't lost yet in a double elimination tournament, right? So it's actually kind of not standard, or not always done this way. Often what t tournaments will do is they'll make it so that the upper bracket team has to actually lose two series. Uh, in order to lose the tournament, and the lower bracket team only has to lose one series to lose the tournament uh, in the grand finals. The MDI doesn't work that way, so that's already kind of a bigger advantage for the lower bracket team into the grand finals uh, than, you know, a normal competition. You're absolutely right, though, that the upper bracket does get some advantages, right? Making it, like, having more time to practice, not having to play back-to-back -back matches into the grand finals, uh, and having time to practice those maps, even without the plus 20s, like, yes, that's, that is a set of advantages. Um, but I think it's offset by the fact that, like, the lower bracket team has already lost once in the tournament, and the upper bracket team hasn't, right? There's a reward for that. Yeah, yeah I've always so, just thought of it as, like, that's the reward you get for winning and not ever losing, is that you get that break, and you don't have to be tired out by playing an extra match in between your uh, upper finals and the grand finals. So, something that is interesting to me, though, is, like, there's so few upsets in MDI, I feel like, a lot of the time, that it's kind of... It, do, it does become problematic in that regard. So maybe there could be something to done, could be done to increase upsets. That's not like, I don't want to say arbitrary, but it's like, there shouldn't be, it should be forced upsets, but there should be a way that teams who have less time to practice than 16 hours, a, 16 hours a day are able to actually compete. Yeah. That's something that you could definitely, you know, like if, if your goal is to make it so that, um, you, if you're trying to design a tournament structure where the best team wins less often, uh, you could come up with you. You would try and reduce the upper bracket advantage even further, right? Like you would. I think. I think to me, it's just like. I, I think it's hard on the competitors to warrant practicing 16 hours a day, seven days a week, um, especially since WoW is not exactly like the most stable of esports. It's not like like a tier one esport. Um, so the teams either have to like stream or they have to like forego doing other things with their other jobs and generally just won't have enough practice time where there are some teams that are able to commit all of their time and like all their energy to it. So I think that if there was, so like obviously like the obvious solution is obviously make a league and like pay the players more and like pay them salaries and stuff like that. It's not really reasonable for a while. Yeah, that, that like <laughs> any obvious solution can't include increasing the budget of the, um, the whole thing by a huge amount, right? Like that doesn't, that's not a solution, right? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's hard to say. Like basically the, it should be try to, it should try to be as even as possible uh, given the, the restraints, but like the best team ultimately should win. But we are, I think we are currently seeing the best team win, which is not a bad thing. Yeah. I, I think that there's definitely some incentive to like s make that a smaller gap for teams wanting to go from like, nothing to competitive with method on the other hand i don't know like if a team is practicing a lot and you know really really good yeah i, I don't think we hard, right? i don't think we want to bend over bend over backwards to, like try and screw exactly. those teams right like exactly i but, agree with that it, it's hmm it, it definitely it definitely is like a like a rough predicament because you don't want to like be screwing other teams over uh but you do want to like even the playing field because some teams just don't have a thousand hours to practice yeah, it's it's tough. There's not an easy solution to it. Um, I mean, it's just a, it's that, a weird esport. Like it's hard yeah. to make live key pushing into an esport. It's as simple as that. All 
All right. Um, I think that about does it here for our questions and answers. Anything else that we missed? Tell us, trial. Anything you guys want to talk about this week? Ooh, actually, one more th one more thing that I want to uh, one more point that I wanted to make on that last topic is that viewers always love like an underdog story too, and it's really hard to get underdog stories in WoW esports. So I wonder, like, maybe that would be That's good true. for viewership. Maybe that I don't know. It's hard to say. Yeah, I don't know how you facilitate that more with the rules of the MDI because the MDI is such a like the better team wins such a high percentage of the time if they're like even a Practice. if there yeah. if there's a notable gap in skill between two teams the better team is winning such a high percentage of those matches. Um, there's really it's 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 kind of like chess right where like the better chess player just wins so often against each other whereas like the better poker player wins against the worst poker player maybe sixty or seventy percent of the time instead of hundred percent of the time. 50, 52% of the yeah, time. Yeah, 52%, something solid. like that. Those yeah. are those are the ones that make it a little bit more... Because, you know, the underdog wins more often. So, yeah. Tough problem to solve. Uh, I don't think that anybody has a good suggestion to solve it yet that doesn't cause more problems than than good. Maybe, uh, maybe it shouldn't be a problem to solve. Yeah, so it, it might just be something where it's like, all right, this is... you know, this It's is, a speed run. It's like, how it is. Speed runs. Yeah, it's just, it, may just, it may just be how it is. All right. That does it for our show this weekend. This week, I guess, this middle of the week. Uh, we'll be back, so Tells and I casting the MDI this weekend, and then we'll be back again on this channel in seven days' time. Uh, thanks, everybody, for watching. Bye. Bye.